Welcome to the Terminal Value Podcast. We have Christy Nicholson with BusinessMentorUK.com. And what we're going to be talking about is we're actually going to be uh, talking about value-based succession planning. And there's a couple of different avenues that we're going to be uh, exploring here. One is the normal succession planning, which is where you have someone who has built a business and is looking to be moving on and they have to figure out, you know, how are they going to exit? Uh, Because as Christine was talking with me about in the pre-interview, a lot of people exit their business without selling it. So it's mean you it means you end up creating value without getting anything in exchange for it, which just feels criminal. Uh, mm. But then the other thing that, I, that we really want to talk about is succession planning for the rainmaker or the person who brings in the business, because that is, I think, a part that is critically important and so easy to overlook. Uh, so anyway, Christine, uh, don't let me talk too much. Introduce yourself and let's get the conversation going. Oh, great. Uh, It's so good to be on this show that talks about something that I am absolutely dialed into from a passion perspective. So I've been doing succession and exit planning for about 15 years. Um, Actually, my entire career has been built around succession planning. Um, uh, And it's been a very strange journey to get here. But this is all I do now. And it's the thing that I'm most passionate about. Yeah, well, and I, I think the thing is, right, you know, when you're starting a business, it's really easy to just say, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll worry about that later. Uh, but of course, then, you know, later comes. And if you're not prepared, it can, you can have an enormous mess to deal with, uh, you know, because it, you know, what, what I've seen is that it's, you, it's about a two year process to adequately prepare a business to be sold. And most people think about it about two months before they want to sell, uh, you know, which of course ends up meaning that it's, they either have to try to compress two years of work into two months, which results in a lot of stuff being done poorly or not at all, you know, or ideally if you set up your processes, systems, et cetera, from the beginning, so that when you're ready to sell, there'll be less hoops to jump through uh, that could theoretically be feasible. I mean, you know, that, to, to poke some holes in my theory here. So, so you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I would say perhaps two years is the thin end of uh, most people's, uh, what, when most people should be doing it. If you want to do it fast, you can do it in two years. Um, the great best time to start is day one. Yeah. Um, uh, succession and exit planning is a bit like life assurance. Mm-hmm. It's one of those things you keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And then what happens is somebody you know that's close to you or close to your age well, you know, one yeah. of your close member of uh, friends uh, or a member of your family dies and all of a sudden you start thinking about life insurance. You, then you start thinking about the vulnerabilities in your business. Yeah. And so whilst the best time to think about it is day one, the next yeah. best time to think about it is the day after that. And the third best time is today. Today. And the fourth best time is tomorrow. Yeah. So, so even if you only did one thing today, you sell real um, estate because you sound like everybody I know who sells investment real estate. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah, I interrupted yeah. you. I'd be, I'd, no, I'd no, be no, no, no. And it is, it's because nobody wants to talk about this thing. So, so let, let, let's actually just face some realities. Why do people yeah. leave their businesses? Okay, two reasons. Okay, one, they actively want to and they've done something to physically, positively and actively transfer the ownership of that, whether it's selling, moving on to the next yeah. generation. And that's less than 50% of all business owners. So what happens to the plus 50% others that take option two, Um, where the four horsemen of the apocalypse come and hit you, death, disease, disability, or divorce, things that you don't plan for, that not only, I mean, if you're dead, who cares, you know, because you you don't, but the mess that you leave behind is is this trail of destruction. Your, Your family have lost a loved one. They've also lost an income. They're now picking up a business that they've got no idea how to run. Um, sometimes the people in your business don't even know how to run your business. Everybody feels lost and all that value that you've built over the years literally just disappears. Now, like you said, you use the word criminal and it is, it's criminal. Seriously, if you were looking at someone else, you wouldn't let them do this. Yeah. So, So the reason why people don't do it is because they think it's hard. And I am here to tell you that it's not easy but it's also not complicated. It doesn't have to be difficult. It's just not easy. It is straightforward though. And there's some pretty simple steps that you can put in place. Well, and, you know, because at least the the way that I think about this type of thing is that, you know, what, 
at least, you know, what, what, what I would think would make it the e uh, business easiest to transfer or sell would be if you have as many things as possible documented, if you have as many things as possible, um, you know, archive, you know, either run by systems or at least tracked in systems. And then if you have as many things as possible set up so that they can, you know, so that they can be done by, by fungible resources. So, because, you know, another thing that I've seen that a lot of businesses run into is you'll have, say, somebody who gets hired early and they'll come in and they'll start taking on more and more and more and more responsibility. And then eventually they'll get to where they essentially like, the entire business depends on them. So you have the owner who is kind of doing the, you know, the high level uh, 10,000 foot thing. And there'll be one person under, you know, somewhere in their organization where everything has to go through them. And basically if they either leave or, you know, uh, decide they're done, or if something happens to them, then the whole thing falls apart. Uh, absolutely. Uh, fundamentally it comes down to one sentence. Yeah. Do you have the right people mm -hmm. doing the right thing at the right time for the right reason in the right way? And then if you've got all of those things in, and, and, let's, and how do you get the right people doing all of those stuff? Well, first of all is you've probably got a plan. It's probably in your head. If you just get it documented and put it, put it down, it doesn't need to be simple. It can stick on yeah. one side of that paper. Have a plan that you can share with everyone. Then have processes and systems. So if you do something more than once, document it. it that, mm -hmm. that bit is really easy because everybody gets tied up and they start folding yeah. themselves like paper clips um, yeah. over processes. But actually, all the process is... is it doesn't have to be complex. Yeah, 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 I know. But people kind of make it complicated because <laughs> they can't believe it's that easy. Well, um, well so like, for example... Oh, go ahead. It, 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 well, I mean, one of the main reasons is it's like, that must be difficult. But actually what, what it is, is that's just the devil on their shoulder going, that's boring. Yes, <laughs> and yes. I want to go and do the interesting stuff. Yeah. So. Well, and so, because I know, you know during my corporate career, uh, you, know, what, you know, one of the things that was big in uh, the finance and accounting organization is what they call business process management, which is a fancy way of saying documentation. You know, you document a process. Uh, you get agreement on the process, and then you track, uh, and then you track whether you have excur you know, compliance or excursions. And of course, you know the you know these types of things tend to get pitched by consulting agencies, which make it seem really, which I think intentionally overcomplicate these things. Yeah. I mean, you know, because at least you know because the you know so like for example, the way that I set up documentation for my business. Now I'm a little nerdy, which is where I you know I have a I have folders for each of the main areas of the APQC process classification framework. But inside there is just a, basically a doc that's a, a document that says, hey, what's this process? What's the reason behind the process? What's the desired yeah. outcome? How do you do it? And then just a log of all the changes that have been, you know, how, how do you do it? How do you measure it? And then a log of all the changes that have been made. It always amazes me that the one question that nobody tends to ask their staff is, if you're doing your job properly, what does success look like? What does success look like yeah. for you? And what does success look like for the business? And if you ask that question of everybody, you're probably going to be surprised at how they would approach the role that they've got. You might be surprised that they don't understand what the yeah. outcome that they're trying to achieve is, you know, and that's just, you know, a bit of clarity, a bit of communication. Some of them are going to come up with some brilliant ideas that is going to shave off time which is yeah. time is money. It's going to make the, the um, client experience better. Uh, it's going to make the employee experience better. And, and all of that adds to reducing the stress on the, on the business owner. But yeah. the problem is that most business owners, and I'm a card carrying control freak. Okay. So I have to confess this. So like, this is, this is do as I say, don't do as I do. <laughs> but most business owners do have this kind of stranglehold where they, they feel like everything has to go through them. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you just kind of loosen the stranglehold that you have um, and actually define the outcomes for people, then, and, and then let them get on with it the best way they can. If you've got the right people and they've got the right view of business, and they really enjoy their jobs, so they're the right people in the right roles, they're going to come up with some innovative, more efficient, more effective ways of doing 
stuff that you might not have thought of. Yeah. And every business owner is afraid of, of two things. Okay. They're, first of all, they're afraid if they let their employees loose, that the, the employees will fail because that will damage the business. But equally, they're also afraid that if they let their employees loose, their employees will succeed and do better than they did. So it, it is, yeah. you know, and I have got clients who've been very open about this. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, you know, they're very self-aware. Um, but they've said, you know, well, well, what if they fail? But even worse, what if they succeed? And I went, yeah, but if they succeed, you just reflect in their glory. Your business is great. And then you go, look how I trained them. Yeah. And they went, oh, I never thought of it like that. Well, <laughs> so, well, and, uh, uh, but like, for example, you know, I'd say, you know, because uh, you know, a lot of people who become entrepreneurs, you know, end up doing some form of professional services. Um, and so I would say, okay, well, you know, if you, you know, if you mentor somebody, who ends up being highly successful, and let's say they end up leaving and getting their own thing going, there's a good chance they can either partner with you or refer business to you. And so yeah. you, you, you know, you, you can actually grow your own business development, <laughs> your own business development partners, uh, if you really embrace that idea. Well, like we were talking before the, the recording started, um, I, you know, I, I'm fairly frequently talked to firms of accountants. And uh, accountants are absolutely rubbish. I, I get sweeping generalization alert, but they are generally rubbish at communicating effectively with their clients or, or seeing the opportunities in their clients to create more value for their clients and therefore create more value for their own practices. Yeah. And it's just bizarre. They've got this unique insight into all of their clients. I mean, their clients are going to share the most intimate business information with them because of all the compliance stuff. And yet, and they're usually doing things like payroll and and, and other kind of additional services. And because of that unique insight, you can actually go and support those businesses so much more, so much so that every single member of your practice, from the receptionist right the way up to the senior partner, could be a rainmaker in your business. And all it is, is actually looking at what you're doing for the client and Mm -hmm. seeing what the client is going through. So classic example, payroll. At the beginning of the year, the payroll had 20 people on it. Now I can see that the payroll's got 26 people on it. That's growth. Okay. As the payroll assistant, I need to point that out to the partner and go, there's an opportunity, get in there. Yeah. Now, Best case scenario, so that's the second best scenario. The best scenario is where the payroll assistant can actually phone the person who's giving them the payroll data and say, hey, what's going on in your business? Now, they're not going to be speaking to the business owner typically. What's going on in your business then? And actually finding out stuff and then going, hey, that's a real opportunity. I think you need to speak to somebody else in in the practice. Let them come and help you with that rather than you struggling. And that's a Two minute conversation with a payroll assistant. So oh, that's uh, it that works in every business. That's uh, that, that that's excellent, and uh, I mean, as, and especially kind of uh, bringing it bringing it back to the idea of succession planning. Um, one of the things that uh, you know, when you were talking about uh, about writing things down and uh, and documenting, um, uh, yeah, a thought that kind of flashed in my mind, but I didn't want to interrupt you, is that I think that there's a tendency to feel like if you're documenting something or you're writing something down, that you need to do it right. And you know, the the first thing to remember is that something. If you write down, if you document something, even if it is terrible, that is infinitely better than nothing. <laughs> and so, so basically, if you just take the track, the tack that if there is, if I have something with no documentation, get it to some documentation. And if there's some documentation that's not that good, make it better. If you can do one of those two things, uh, say three to five times a week, then you know you'll have amazing results after one to two years. It's, it's a bit like professional athletes, you know, they yeah. train and train and train. And when they get to the top of their game and they're training for the big competitions, they're looking for, you know, a hundredth of a yeah. millisecond advantage. They're looking for tiny percentage improvements. So I always talk about throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks. So it's, if, if you, nobody, like, nobody can argue with a blank piece of paper. Yeah. If you put something down, and hand it to someone else in the business and say, just test that for me. You're doing two things. 
you're actually testing the process and you're also getting someone preferably from outside your department to come in and actually understand yeah. what you do. So there's always, I, I'm a big fan of job rotation and, yeah. and, and actually having this sharing um, thing. Um, the football club that I support in the UK, the soccer club that I support in the UK. I know this is a, this is a globally aware uh, podcast, and you know I'm in the US. We call it soccer, but like literally everyone else in the world calls it football, calls it so it's football. fine. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm a, I'm a West Ham fan for my uh, sins, and uh, they have job rotation there. Now, some might argue that occasionally it's the players that get rotated off the pitch and the back office yeah. staff are playing, but that definitely doesn't happen. But the players still get to go and work in the gift shop, they work in the hospitality, oh, awesome. etc. Yeah. So, um, and it is a really good way of being able to empathise. But the other thing is that, let's get back to succession planning for a minute. <laughs> it's, if, you, if you've got people who actually understand what each other does, then when you start to uh, develop them, they, they, have, they will have empathy, not just across their own peer group, but they'll have empathy through the vertical, through, you know, people that report to them, people that they report to. And that just greater collaboration happens, better communication happens. And people are, find it easier then to say, actually, do you know what? I actually want, I want my boss's job. Yeah. Now, now I can have a conversation with my boss about what's going to get me there. And what do you need to push you up into that next mm -hmm. role? And it could be that the conversation goes, well, I can develop you for this, but I ain't going nowhere. So actually what we're going to be looking at is developing you to backfill my role if anything were to happen to me. But I might end up training you to move somewhere else. And that's sadly, that's just part of, of life. Well, um, and, and I don't necessarily think it's sad. I mean, you know, because uh, uh, so uh, it's. And again, I'm, I suppose I'll be showing my age here, but, you know, I'm, I, I'm a late Gen Xer. I'm probably one of the, you know, one of the much later years in uh, uh, kind of in the proverbial generation X. But I think the, um, you know, kind of people in my generation before kind of held this idea that you should be able to be in a job for a really long time. And, you know, people who are in management, who are my generation before, who statistically is the majority of upper management in most companies, have, have this, in my view, nonsense notion that it's some kind of betrayal if somebody leaves you. You go, A, there should be no expectation that people, that people stay in their jobs indefinitely. And, you know, and then, you know, it's, there should be no guilt associated with people going to another opportunity. I mean, because like, I know when every time I've always managed a team, I always told my people, hey, look, if you are looking at something else, don't keep it a secret. Tell me, because I want to help you. Uh, I, I want to help you to go find what's going to be the right thing for you, because I would rather get your best while you're here and not have you try to be keeping secrets because you're afraid that I'm going to somehow take it yeah. out on you. And because what that does, it does two things. A, you get better engagement, but then B, it makes people think twice about leaving because they don't know who they're going to be going to work for. And because yeah. not everybody holds that position. Yeah. There's, there's um, a famous uh, Richard Branson quote, which is train people so that they can leave, treat them so that they don't want to. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, I'm a big proponent uh, of that. And, and actually, if you do that, if they do leave, they're the kind of people that you want back. You know, there are some Absolutely. people that you're going to be waving goodbye and you're going to go, oh, that door is so shut. They are never <laughs> coming back. Um, but then there are other people that, you know, let's say I've got to, you know, I've developed my team underneath me. Some of them have gone off, but now I'm definitely leaving. I'm going to be going back to that team, see yeah. how they've developed elsewhere, yeah. because they're naturals to come back in and replace me. And we've got to start thinking as business owners about, we are dispensable. A hundred percent of business owners leave their business. And if you think you're going to leave planning for that until you're in a box, that's way too late. And, yes. I, and I can tell you a very, very quick cautionary tale about a guy who built a business up. He started building, he invented a product, started building it in his garage. And over the years, built this business up. So it was in excess of 10 million pounds turnover. He was employing just under 100 staff. And uh, he was in his early 50s. Mm -hmm. And he was getting divorced from his wife. And it was quite bitter because he'd literally in his 50s met the love of his life. 
and he bought a house in his own name and he was getting it all ready for the new bride. He was just waiting for the divorce to go through. No will, no shareholder agreement. I can see where this is going. <laughs> he was up a ladder and he fell off the ladder and within seven days he was dead. Oh, ooh, no hurts. will meant that everything went to his ex-wife, who, uh, not quite ex-wife. Not quite ex-wife. And yeah. he was very, very bitter. And uh, she knew nothing about the business. She, But because she was now a shareholder, she had the rights to put a, herself in as a director. She appointed herself as a director and started spending the company's money. And 18 months later, the company was insolvent. Now, he could have done anything to stop that. He could have yeah. had a will. He could have had a shareholder agreement. Um, just those two things alone as well. I mean, he had a fairly healthy succession plan. Yeah. But that it could not be overridden. Uh, sorry, it was overridden by the wife's ability to appoint yeah. a self-director. And that that's really sad. 100 people lose their jobs, 10 million pounds worth of business that just eradicates like that. That, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty sizable company too. Cause you, know, you figure, okay, yeah, you know, a hundred heads, 10 million pounds. That's, you know, m most businesses don't make it to that size. No, no. And it, it, you know, it's, it, it's a fairly sizable business compared to most, but actually the fundamentals are still the same. Mm -hmm. And if I can, if, if any business owner goes away from this podcast today and they just think about one thing that they can do, then please have a will. Yeah. And the second thing is put a shareholder agreement in place that will protect at least some of the value in your business. Um, but the biggest thing that's going to add value, so let's get onto a happier note. Yeah. One thing that is going to add, add value is, as a business owner, get out of the way. Find a way of getting out of the day-to-day -day so that you can start working strategically. You will be happier. Your business will be worth more. Uh, well, I think that's uh, that's actually really uh, a really kind of uh, good segue. So, because you know, we've been talking about uh, you know, we've been talking about some of the things that we need to do to document about the the, the things that we need to do to, to succession plan, and then how to use it to really uh, to really create value. Um, I think those those are actually kind of really good takeaway points. Um, are there you know are, are there one to two extra uh, kind of extra pieces of wisdom that you can share before, uh, before we wrap for this episode. Uh, and then afterwards, of course, let everybody know where they can, uh, where they can find you online. Um, I think actually that if I was wanting, I always want people to go away with one thing that they can do right now that, that I love it. And, uh, uh, but I think on this, there's, there's, there are several, uh, one is actually really start thinking about how you can get out of the way yeah. Um, and you know, one of the things that you can do for that is think about ways that you can make every employee in your business a rainmaker mm -hmm. and think about how they can bring the customers in or pull the customers closer and never forget that an existing customer is definitely cheaper to keep and uh, to get and yes. keep than in, than a new customer. So if your entire team is working on keeping your existing customers um, then they're, they're effectively making the weather. They're, they're generating value in your in your business. And, and your then, existing customers are also usually your best advocates. Um, absolutely. And, and so, because yeah. yeah, if you can like if you if you take a portion of what you would ordinarily spend to try to go acquire new cap to customers and just allocate a piece of that to rewarding your existing customers for you know having you know for enthusiastic referrals you know i'm not talking about you know lame things like a 20 dollar amazon car but you know something really meaningful yeah. either like you know say you know, either sponsor dinners or sponsor events something that like really creates that connection uh that can actually be and i'm going off topic but that's all right uh, <laughs> that, that can yeah, actually I, be a really um a really powerful uh method yeah so do you know what one thing is that works really well. When you send an invoice to a customer uh -huh. and they pay it on time, you send a thank you. Honestly, mm. that is, it's so simple. You can even automate it, but just saying thank you for paying us on time. Oh my God. That I, you yeah. wouldn't believe the, the, the amount of um, uh, reward you get from that. And um, but there is a thousand things that I could could say. And um, probably the best thing is if you go onto my website, which is 
um, businessmentoruk.com. Um, you'll see everything that I do. Um, I've written four business books and the latest one is called Sell It. And it's literally everything is in there um, to help you get your business ready mm-hmm. for whenever you leave. But I, I mean, I call Sell It because most people think that they have to sell their business, but there's loads of other options in, in there. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm most active on, on LinkedIn. So you can easily find me on LinkedIn, um, mainly because I'm a multi award-winning business mentor Mm -hmm. um so if you if you search for christine nicholson business mentor i always come up at the at the top so uh, outstanding well christine really appreciate your time today and uh so yeah so that's uh christine nicholson business mentor look for on linkedin and uh christine uh hope you have a wonderful rest of your day thank you very much take care Thank you for listening to the Terminal Value Podcast. Please feel free to visit me online at www.terminalvalue.biz where you can subscribe, find me on social, and then we can connect and just keep the conversation going. I'm really looking forward to hearing from you and I hope you have a wonderful day. All rights reserved. No part of this broadcast may be produced in any form by any means without written permission from Business of Life, LLC. All trademarks and brands referred to herein are the property of their respective owners.